So the Song of Songs, um, as we said, is the last class. I will mention the fact that uh, a couple of classes did not get recorded. Um, apparently a button didn't get pushed at one point. A couple of them, I was in such a rush after getting back from a trip, I didn't bring the camera, didn't have time to go back and get it. I do intend to re-record those. Um, I can't tell you exactly when it will be because of my schedule in the next few weeks. But sometime before the end of the summer, those will be up for those people who missed them. And the classes in here are first and second songs. Those were the two we missed in here. There was one class from the, uh, as well from the Epistles uh, course. And uh, we will get those back up, I promise you. But I'm sorry about that. That's the first time in six terms, which means in 18 courses, that we have failed to get something recorded. So I guess it was inevitable it was going to happen sometime. So we'll, we'll get there. <coughs> Um, as always, we look at this, I think, I really like this chart, which is why I use it all the time for the Old Testament, because it does break down into very clear sections. You know, the, the five books of the Pentateuch, or the Law, or Torah, then you have the books of the Prophets. Now, this is the sort of English version. This is the Protestant version of this. Then the, what we call the Wisdom Books, which we're studying now, the last of which, and they call Song of Solomon. There are several names for the bit, this book. Song of Songs, Song of Solomon. That's my, my telephone is going to go way up, I think. Unless that was somebody else's. Um, mine's in the office. So. Uh, it's also called, in Latin, Canticle. Canticle is the Latin word for song. Um, that's where you get cantata, um, or, con, you know, what's the name of the group here? Cantantes. Cantantes. All of those have the same root, uh, which is, you know, Canticle from Latin. So Spanish. And uh, all of those are uh, Latin roots. Romance languages means doesn't mean romantic like <laughs> it means from Rome, which is Latin. So all of the Romance languages, French, Spanish, Italian, uh, all are rooted in Latin, which was the Roman language or Romance language. Okay, I don't know why the Romans were thought of as being particularly romantic, but um, then of course we have the major prophets, the minor prophets. I, I call these prophetic books. I'm sorry, these are historic books. The major prophets, the minor prophets, and that's a real good way of understanding how the Old Testament is kind of put together. Now, these are the sections that we have in our Protestant Bible. I say that because the Hebrew Bible is broken up differently. The last book in the Hebrew Bible is Chronicles, um, and they don't have First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Kings. As we Nehemiah's one book, those books are all one book, as we've talked about many times. But just so you have a good sense of that. And so they have many fewer books, and it's exact, but it's exactly the same material. It's just broken up differently. And uh, and could I ask you uh, to move forward somewhere? I made two guys move off that back row earlier, and so I would feel bad if I didn't let them let you sit back there. Um, so I think this is a very useful way of simply having a grasp on what's in that book because it becomes just this monolithic mass unless you find some way in your mind to understand how it's pieced together. So. She may need to. Okay, let's talk about the book which is known as the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, or the Book of Canticle. Um, the Song of Songs is one, it's in the last section of the Hebrew Bible, which is called the um, Ketuvim, or the Writings. You will remember we have a Torah, the first five books, according to the Jewish breakdown. Then we have the Nevaim, or the prophetic books, and then the Ketuvim, or the, um, the writings, which is the last section. So the Song of Songs uh, comes into that last section, the Ketuvim. It is one of the five megalot, or scrolls, that are especially used during the uh, special festivals uh, throughout the, the Jewish year. Uh, it is traditionally attributed to Solomon, which is why it became known as the Song of Solomon. The Hebrews call it the Song of Songs. And I'm going to quote Rabbi Akiva in, in a, a little bit, who's one who really advocated that, and there's a reason for it. You all remember uh, the Sid Caesar show, Show of Shows? Mm -hmm. Is anybody old enough to remember the Show of Shows? Okay. Uh, very funny. <laughs> well, the, this book is called the Song of Songs for the same reason that that was called the Show of Shows, because, you know, uh, Sid Caesar, in his humor, was saying, this is like the Show of Shows. It's the best. Well, this is called the Song of Songs because it historically was seen as being of particular beauty and of particular importance 
And I'll talk to you about why that is in a few minutes. Traditionally, it is attributed to Solomon because it does start out by saying, you know, the song of songs of Solomon. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Solomon wrote it because it could mean like what Solomon writes or consistent with Solomon or um, wisdom literature like what Solomon, it could mean a number of things, not just that Solomon wrote it. Although traditionally they've interpreted that as meaning it was written by Solomon. It's actually quite unlikely, you know, if Solomon did write it, then it would have been 970 to 931 BC. There's some indication it may be later because there, as you know, you know all this stuff now. <laughs> when the Babylonians uh, destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC and the Jews went off into captivity for about 50 or so years and then in 530 or so they came back uh, at least some of them came back uh, the, the first returnees uh, during that period of time the people began to speak Aramaic which was a version of Chaldean which is the ancient language of the Babylonians that's why you you find well, part of the book of Daniel is written in Aramaic although it's all translated to us in English. And that's why there are a number of Aramaic expressions in the New Testament, because the common street language for people in Jesus' time was Aramaic, the language that they had picked up in a couple of generations of having lived under the authority of the Babylonians, actually in Babylonian exile. Well, um, and that's, you know, like Talitha Kumi, you know, there are several expressions which we have in the original language. Those are almost all in Aramaic, not in Hebrew. So, um, there are parts of this Song of Songs which carry what appear to be Aramaic expressions, which has led some scholars to believe that either it was written after, either during or after the Babylonian exile in the 500s, or that it perhaps was written earlier, maybe by Solomon, but then was edited later, and there were Aramaic kinds of expressions that came into it. Uh, when, when I say Aramaic expressions, Anytime another language has an influence on a primary language, you get idioms, for instance, you get various other kinds of expressions which are not natural to the first language, but clearly have been introduced from somewhere else. And it appears as though that's the case with the Song of Songs, that there are Arabic expressions which would indicate that it was sometime mid-500s or slightly later, okay? But it could still very well have been written by Solomon and simply collated or edited later on by someone else. We believe it's here for a reason. We believe that you know, God put it here. Now, the Song of Songs is quite unique in that it makes no reference to uh, Yahweh as God of Israel, no, no reference to Yahweh at all, or to the law or covenant, or any of those themes that are really so critical to all the other books in the, in the Old Testament. Um, in fact, it also is quite unique in that it does not talk about wisdom. It's part of the wisdom literature, and yet, it, it, you know, Proverbs is get wisdom, get understanding. The whole book is about one way or another getting wisdom. Ecclesiastes comes around to the point of saying, you know, wisdom, you know, wisdom has its limits, but it's better to be wise than foolish. And so, it, it clearly, of the books that we have in in the, the wisdom literature, the ones that are most uh, typically like the ancient genre of wisdom literature. And it wasn't just Israel, all of the ancient Near East, from, from Egypt up through Mesopotamia and even the Hittite cultures up into Asia Minor, all of them had some version of wisdom literature. Wisdom literature being the teachings about how to live your life, okay? and about some about how to relate to God as well, but mostly very practical day-to-day -day stuff on how to live your life. Well, um, while Song of Songs talks about human experience, you know, a particular kind of human experience, it does not advocate for wisdom. It doesn't say what, again, the very best of, of the best examples of wisdom literature we have in the Old Testament, which would be Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, maybe Job a little bit, although, you know, Job is sort of a long and extended essay on one thing, and that is how we to understand suffering, especially undeserved suffering. But here, um, the Song of Songs doesn't talk about wisdom. In fact, the Song of Songs is about human love relationships. It's a man and a woman with an audience. They have a group of the daughters of Jerusalem, they're called, or daughters of Zion in Old Translation, um, who, are, who are sort of the cheerleaders, sort of, you know, uh, pushing them on. They apparently are friends of the woman. There are three characters here. One is the woman, who is uh, the female lover. One is the, the male, 
the male lover, and then this, this sort of third character is this chorus of the women of Jerusalem who are talking to the, to the woman who's the lover and encouraging her and saying, man, that's great, boy, he's handsome, you know, all kinds of things like that. The same sort of things that high school girls would say. Um, <laughs> although a little more adult than that. Um, so it is about a human love relationship, um, and especially, um, let's face it, and people get uncomfortable with this, it's a, it's, a lot of it's about human sexual relationship in the context of a committed love affair. Now we say committed because uh, it is clear throughout all of the, the book of Song of Songs, this is not a fling. This is something where they fall in love and they're really committed to each other. The language is very clear that they are, uh, and it never says they're married, but the indication is that they either are or at their point of marriage. In fact, one of the scenes here is a, um, they witness a uh, royal wedding procession. And the symbolism there of wedding and the importance of the wedding and of marriage itself is, is important to understand the context. But a lot of this is about sex. And it is an affirmation of human love, and it's an affirmation of the expression of that love in the context of that married and committed relationship to the one you love. Nothing lighthearted about it, nothing um, inappropriate about it, but it is, you know, it's pretty straightforward in that regard. Now, I said the theme here is human love relationship, especially as a symbol for divine love, because that's how it's usually been interpreted or understood. First, the, the Jewish people uh, determined, and, and this is the only way I got into the canon, <laughs> if it had been interpreted as it is literally, that is an expression of human romantic love and human physical love, then it probably, you know, there were questions about whether it should be in the canon. A number of different people uh, then decided that it really is, um, without saying whether or not it, the literal part of it was strictly true, or I mean if that's the point of it, uh, they advocated that it is allegorical, it is an expression of God's love for his people, the Israelites. Um, now, let me, I told you I would quote uh, Rabbi Ahmad, um, Rabbi Ahmad bin Joseph, in the end of the first start of the second century, he really defended uh, the Song of Songs as being a godly book that it should be part of the Hebrew canon. In fact, this is what he said. Um, when, when somebody said, well, isn't this kind of defiling to Holy Scripture to put it in there because it's about physical love? And Rabbi Ahmad said, God forbid, no one in Israel, I'm sure he said, God forbid, <laughs> no one in Israel disputed about Song of Songs, I'm quoting him here, saying that it does not, uh, that it, it defiles the hands for all of eternity in its entirety. Jewish rabbi tended to speak in hyperbole. For all of eternity in its entirety is not as worthy as the day on which Song of Songs was given to Israel. For all the writings are holy, but Song of Songs is the holy of holies. He really liked this book. Well, because he was so influential at the time period in which they were making these decisions, and there were other rabbis that, that advocated too, and they, because they saw it, or at least it was interpreted as being allegorical, that the love between the man and the woman in this book is representative of the love God has for his chosen people. And that allegory actually exists elsewhere in the Old Testament. The whole book of Hosea is exactly that. Hosea is told by God to go and get this, this prostitute, an unfaithful woman, Gomer, and marry her. She keeps running off, and God keeps saying, go back and get her. And that's a, a real life allegorical statement about the relationship God had with his, the Israelites. That he loved them, and he in effect married them by making them his chosen people, and yet they were unfaithful to him over and over again. And yet he would go and find them and do whatever's necessary to bring them back. So that allegory is not inconsistent with the rest of Scripture. But a big reason why that allegory was pushed is because they were uncomfortable about the Bible containing a book that talks about human love, especially human physical love. Okay. Um, so we must see it as an affirmation of human love for its own sake, and I think it is fair for us to see it as a reflection of God's love uh, for us. Now, the Jewish people started this idea that it was an allegory for the relationship between God and the chosen people. That carried over very strongly into the Christian days. Origen is the first one who specifically articulated it, or the theologian Origen. But the Christian um, Christians looking at this book, Song of Songs in the Old Testament, did the same thing the Jews had, and they determined that it was it's allegorical, and it has to do, in that case, they shifted it, that it has to do with um, the relationship between Jesus and the church. 
because you will remember scripture says that we are the, the he's the bridegroom and we are the bride and so it's even more natural or it's more obvious to be able to say that this relationship between the man and the woman in Song of Songs is reflective of Jesus the, the bridegroom and his church the bride right um, and so that allegory has been consistent throughout most of the, the history of the, the Christian church looking at this um, a, a real brief outline, and we're going to look at a more specific outline in a few minutes, is in four parts. First, there is the courtship, or the falling in love. The indication is uh, they've seen each other, you know, and the woman especially is talking to her friends who are the daughters of Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, again, you get this image like they're a bunch of high school girls at a football game looking at the, you know, at the the young man, and then they picked, he's picked out one, and she's talking about it, and I always get that image whenever I read the Song of Songs. Um, and, and so she's talking to her friends, and they're saying, oh yeah, boy, he's really hot, and you know, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and then eventually, and then come to find out that he expresses the same kind of things about her. He has noticed her, and how beautiful she is. Now, I find it interesting that some of the expressions, because both the woman goes through a period, as we'll look at in a minute, where she talks about how beautiful her male lover is. He has expressions about how beautiful his, you know, the, the woman is that he's fallen for. Um, and some of their expressions are pretty, you know, but your, your breasts are like two young gazelles. Um, your, it talks about your, your neck being like the Tower of David, but then it also says your nose is like a high tower pointed toward Lebanon. I'm going, that's a compliment? <laughs> um, and your stomach is like a mound of wheat. I've heard of wheat belly, but that's something different. Um, and so some of these expressions, which were considered the highest of praise back then, we would look at and go, well, really? You know, that gets you in trouble if you said it to a <laughs> so, But still, for them, there is the, these long passages. I say long. Um, the, the eight chapters are quite short. You know, it's not a very long book. It has eight chapters, but still the uh, chapters are fairly short. So they go through the period of courtship. And then they have the, uh, the, the view of the royal procession of wedding. And the indication is they come together. This outline, which I, I took from a, a little summary book I have, calls it the wedding, that they are united in love. It never actually says they get married, but there's strong indication of that, that their commitment to one another is, is more, more than just a physical attraction, although it certainly is that. It really is a commitment they've made, and the suggestion is it'll be wedding. For one thing, as Jewish people, you know, that's the only way in which they could have fulfilled these obvious desires they have for each other. We then have the struggles, and the struggles are, are reflected in, mostly in the fact that she has dreams. And you have to realize the dreams, because sometimes it's not, in, in this book, it's not obvious who's speaking. And it's difficult sometimes to tell whether this is a dream sequence, which there are several of, or whether it's a real sequence. For instance, she dreams that her, her lover is right outside the door, and she keeps, she keeps putting him off. She doesn't want to open the door. She's teasing him. And finally, when she opens the door, he's disappeared. Where did he go? And she goes out looking for him, and she asks the daughters or her friends to help her look. And she gets the watchman of the city to help her look for him. Well, the watchman who had helped her previously beat her up. Um, and so that apparently is a dream sequence. There, there, there are several dream sequences where there's this suggestion where, you know, uh, but I can't find him, I can't reach him, you know, we can't get to each other. There's something between us kind of thing. Um, and so there are those problems. It's not, they're not angry with each other or whatever, but there seems to be, they seem to be indicating difficulties in, in uh, being able to be married or being able to be together. And then the progress or sort of epilogue of them growing in their love at the end. Um, again, I think it's valid both as a reflection of human love, and, that's, and there's a reason why God put, put that in here, uh, this book in here, but it also um, is an allegorical sense in which God loves us, and, and the, the, the extent, the intensity of that love. Um, some of the verses, and, and the first one gets misquoted often, um, the Song of Songs, chapter 7, verse 10 says, I belong to my lover and his desire is for me. I've heard it, I've seen it on cards, and it says, I am my lover, and he is mine. I am my lover's, and he is mine. It actually is, I belong to my lover, and his desire is for me. Um, but there's a lot of that, I'm yours and your mine, kind of talk in this book. And then, um, one of the things that 
in sort of the struggles that the problem parts, the dream sequences and others, the woman said compares love to death and says it is, you know, it, it is unquenchable. And in fact, she says, don't encourage love before it's time because you really don't want to let that beast out of the cage unless you're ready for it. And she says that at uh, that similar time, many waters cannot quench love, rivers cannot wash it away. If one were to give all the wealth of his house for love, it would be utterly scorned. And so she's going through this period of, uh, part of it is that she was, she's looking at the nature of love and realizing that if, if, if this isn't right, if it's not done correctly, it could destroy you. I mean, it is, it's as final as death. I've heard people say that divorce is like a, you know, it's like a, it's like dying. There's like a death associated with that. I've not been through that. But, um, let's look at now a, an outline, a little more complete outline. The book begins with an introduction. It's an introduction of the woman, of the daughters of Israel, and then the man comes in after that. Then we begin with a dialogue about the love. Uh, it says between the lovers, but it's I mean, early on it's more like observing them at a distance kind of thing, you know, like the football game. Analogy. Then the woman uh, comes around and recalls a visit from her lover, that her lover had been to see her. The woman addresses the daughters of Jerusalem directly, and again, her girlfriends. We then have, the in the third chapter, the sighting of the royal wedding procession and the symbolism of all that is, of making that commitment. Now, I will tell you, the, the, the three characters, and I'll throw it in here, because this has been attributed to Solomon, um, it doesn't mean he wrote it, but it was either dedicated to him, it was of a style that was seen as being of Solomon, Solomonic wisdom or whatever. Um, some more modern scholars, because they've got to do something, they have looked at this and suggested that there is another character in there. And that in fact, the king, and the royal wedding procession sort of sets this off, the king, perhaps Solomon himself, you remember Solomon had 900 wives and 3,000 concubines, I believe it was. Get a hobby. Uh, <laughs> he had a hobby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a different hobby. <laughs> that it may be that this woman is beautiful. And by the way, she describes herself as being very dark-skinned. And she says, uh, uh, even swarthy is one of the translations, she used that word. And she says it's because her brothers forced her to work in their vineyard, so much so that she was not allowed to work in her own. But she apparently has property too. So, and she says she's been burned by the sun, and so her skin is very dark. But then later on, you know, her beauty is attested to not only by her lover, but by others as well, talking about beauty. So they cite this royal wedding procession, and some more modern uh, scholars talking about this say that there is the woman, there is her lover, the man, but that she is also being moved by the king, perhaps Solomon. And that there's, there's a triangle here, not counting the, the, the women, the chorus of women in Jerusalem, and that he's trying to win her over, and that's the point of the royal wedding procession and all of that kind of stuff. I don't find a justification for that in here. Okay? I think that that's, you know, that they grab for straws because it lets them publish something. I, I think that there's only three characters. The man, the woman, introduced first, the man, her lover, and then a character. The chorus, like in Greek drama, is always considered a character because the chorus always speaks together. And that's true of this as well. So, um, they cite the royal wedding procession and the symbolism of that in terms of marriage. The man describes his lover's beauty in all of the very colorful metaphors which we don't really um, understand anymore or use. It's also true that um, there are an inordinate number of specific place names, you know, referring to particular pools by name or streams by name or gardens by name. There's a lot of ge specific geographical reference in this, which is quite unusual. You don't, you don't get a lot of that, especially not in the more poetic kinds of writing. But this is full of that. Um, we then have the woman, after the man describes his lover's beauty, the, the woman addresses the daughters of Jerusalem. Again, it's like, after all these compliments, she's got to talk to her girlfriends for a minute. Then the man describes his lover who visits him because she comes to him, and there's, there's again, there's a dream sequence in there where she describes that she came to the man and almost forcibly dragged him into the chamber where she had been conceived in her mother, and then, and then you find out it's a dream sequence, okay, again. 
that she didn't actually molest the guy on the street and drag him off and you know uh, forcibly have relations with him. So, uh, but you do get those kinds of that kind of imagery is in there, and so clearly what she's saying is this is what I want to do, All right? But again, you then realize that these aren't that she's not recording a real event, uh, but a, a dream or a, an imaginary one. Then we get other observers talking about the woman's beauty and then a final epilogue, which is the continuation of their love as their love grows and they are together. Okay, and then it ends with clearly a sense in which this wasn't just an infatuation, that this is a, a long-term committed relationship. Okay. Any questions about that? Bob? How, how does this fit into the setting of arranged marriages? Well, um, arranged marriages while they existed back then, they almost, it was not the kind of arranged marriages where you'll, you'll, meet your, you'll meet your future spouse at the wedding. I mean, in Muslim countries, that, that quite literally is the case. But in, while the parents would have been involved, in fact, in Jewish times, there were matchmakers involved. You guys have seen Fiddler on the Roof, right? Um, and that, that tradition carried from ancient times to more modern times. It was not a case where the, the matchmaker comes to the parents and said, okay, this is who your, husband, your, who your son or your daughter should marry, and then they decide and it goes on. The suggestion was made, you know, in, that, in the case, um, this is true in Fedora on the Roof, uh, think about Joseph and Mary. Their parents probably were involved, and maybe when they were young, talking about, it'd be great if our kids could marry someday. Let's encourage that. But at the point at which they became old enough to marry, they would have a say in it. And so there was not a sense in which it was an arranged marriage like, like in, in a lot of countries, particularly Islamic countries, where, again, yeah, you'll meet your spouse on your wedding day, and you, know, you have no say in it at all. The Jews did have a say in it. Others might help, but ultimately they had to say, this is the one I want to marry. And that's why Joseph and Mary knew each other. You know, we have all the story about Joseph saying, when it's discovered she's become pregnant, and he's going to set her aside quietly because he's an honorable man. So they knew each other and respected each other, and they were involved in the decision. Joseph could decide, am I going to go through the wedding or not? Uh, so while somebody else may have been involved, the couple was expected to develop a relationship, and they had the primary say in, are we or are we not going to do this marriage? And here we have a man and a woman, we don't have any other characters involved, who clearly, I mean, they depending on how old they were and whether their parents were alive, they probably would have gone to their parents and said, you know, we're going to do this, are you okay with it? And um, if their parents said no, then it would have been a very different story. But we don't get any of that background, but these two clearly had the decision as to whether they get a relationship. Okay? Again, we don't have any clear indication as to date, place, or circumstance. It, uh, the superscription states it is of Solomon, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's identifying the author. It could be simply saying this is of the style of Solomon, or this is like Solomon, or you know, this, this is in Solomon's period, because everything was of the king of, uh, at that time. And as I mentioned, there's enough Aramaic influence, apparently, on the Hebrew in this that it's believed that it may have been, um, may have been later. The, there also are, are indications in this of other love poetry just like wisdom literature, was a very common, I mean, love poetry has always been, in every human culture, a major stream of artistic expression. Love songs, love poetry, um, you know, love, love, love in English, corazón in Spanish, you know, they refer to it as my heart. Um, and so love poetry was very common in Egyptian literature in the times before and during this, this time period. And I say this time period, assuming it was the 10th century Solomon's time or any time after that. Um, the Mesopotamian cultures um, also had a very strong um, stream or flow of love poetry. And in many ways, this is very much reflective of that. Even the Greeks. Now, romantic love, as we think of it today, was invented much later. It was practically a medieval concept. You know, the, uh, the idea that you, you, know, you see somebody in Cupid's arrow and you fall in love and you've got to marry that person. This is quite revolutionary in that that's very much the way this reads. And there would have been other people involved in the process, but people were much more pragmatic about what relationships were and what marriage was back in those days. And so this really is quite progressive in terms of the fact that there's no, no mention of any of that, which would have almost certainly been in the background. Um, 
the interestingly, while a lot of the Jewish people had difficulty accepting this as part of the canon or as part of God's word, other than uh, Rabbi Yaakov and Joseph and some others really, really saying, oh no, we got to do this. This has got to go in. Um, the, I hope nobody's ever offended by my Jewish accents and stuff. I do it with the greatest of respect. Uh, as you, you guys know, my, you know, my love for the Jewish people and my friendship with a lot of Jewish Christians. Um, interestingly enough, the one, one group within Judaism that really has always been in favor of this book are those who are followers of the Kabbalah. Kabbalah, you know, Madonna, the yellow string she wears. Madonna has been a follower of the Kabbalah. Uh, Kabbalah is a mystical branch of Judaism. They get involved in numerology. You know, you've seen the books like the Bible Code, which looks at the, at the, the Hebrew Bible especially is supposed to have a digital code embedded in it that gives you messages. But the Kabbalah is a very mystical, mysterious kind of branch. Well, they have always, and, and they, they have mystical interpretations for virtually all the Old Testament, but the Song of Songs has always been one of their very favorites. So the Kabbalah has always seen Song of Songs as being one of the things that they really, you know, one of their favorites. Um, it, is, it is, as I said, one of the five megalot, or the five scrolls. The megalot or scrolls are the five books that are read from the Old Testament, from the Hebrew Bible at Jewish festivals, at various ones, you know, like Esther is read at Purim, which is, Purim is the celebration of the events that happened in Esther. Well, the, uh, the Book of Song of Songs in modern Judaism is read on the Shabbat Eve, or the Sabbath Eve, uh, Passover, and they do that because, again, allegorically, they decided that it has to do with the relationship of God and his people, the Israelites, the chosen people. So they read it on the Sabbath Eve of Passover, because Passover is the great celebration where God really created uh, the, the chosen people, um, gave them, you know, it's before they left slavery in Egypt. Now, they had been a people before that, but they became a nation under, uh, under Moses and were given the law. And so they really see that as the start of themselves as a people, even more so than when Abraham was called. And so this relationship between God and his people and the fact that God showed his great love for them in the Exodus event and in the giving of the law, that's why they read this on the eve of Shabbat. Um, I could go into you know, a, a number of other things. One of the things that, because the woman's voice is so powerful in this, and she clearly has a mind of her own, and she has her own desires about things, the Song of Songs has been a focus of a lot of feminist biblical scholarship, feminist literature. Um, and bibli feminist biblical critics have been very interested in the representation, which is not what most people think of. I mean, let's face it, you know, Judaism was a patriarchal society, but the first voice we hear in the Song of Songs is a woman's voice. And she's very clear about articulating what she wants in some particular detail. And she gets what she wants. Right? And so it's been of much interest in that regard. Yes, yes I like that. Because uh, we come in, an, in a background, really, made with a lot of taboos, in, with a lot of, in which you cannot express your stuff. Mm -hmm. And this representation of the most explicit, the natural world, I love it. Because yeah. it's not a taboo command, it's a way, and it's a natural way. Right. Yes. And I like that. I like and that's that. why, too, I mean, I, it, whenever it's been, been maturely, because it's not always been maturely received, but it's been, when it's been maturely received by both Jewish and Christian scholars, their response has been, well, human romance and you know, sexual love is a gift of God. And you need to talk about it honestly. It gets warped when you only want to talk about it in the shadows. It's when you can talk about it in as open and as positive a way as the, as the Song of Songs does it that it remains healthy and remains what God wants it to be. And so it is really, it's very important in that regard, I think. Yeah, so any other questions about that? I just a statement. I think it's a great teaching tool for the young. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when they're 12, 13, the hormones start running amok. I mean, they, they say it can't be in the shadows. Yep. And I think this is a great way that it's addressed and yep. it, can help, it can help funnel it, you know, right. for them to. Yeah, you don't hear a lot of sermons from the Song of Songs, <laughs> but, um, and, and understandably so. I mean, some people would be offended, some people wouldn't get it, um, but I think from a teaching point of view, and especially a counseling point of view, and that's very much what you're saying, 
I think that it's very, very valuable in, in, in terms of how uh, of it being a tool that we can use. But again, it is so different that there's some, you know, some format, some platforms from which it's probably not appropriate. Like, you know, preaching from, from it'd be very difficult to do a series on the Song of Songs uh, unless you, you know, unless you want people to stay home from embarrassment. But if you're being honest with it. He says that it's a way of love between um, a husband and wife is completely fine. Right. So he says, you can run right. this way and love your husband. So now when it starts and they're expressing their first desires, it seems clear they're not married because they're sort of seeing each other at a distance. But the indication, and again, that's why I think in the middle when we have that royal wedding procession, that's a symbol of the fact that they are committed to, make, to each other in marriage. And not this is not just a... Flame. It's not just an infatuation that they're fulfilling physically. Okay. Anything else? Yes. The fact that it's a royal wedding could also suggest to us that um, since royalty is important and uh, an elevated position, etc., that marriage is important and it is a, a, an elevated thing and it's something to be striven for. Yeah, it is. It, it, that's very true. Although. Um, David's problems were related to women. <laughs> Solomon's problems were related to women. And both of them had multiple wives. You know, David wasn't, didn't, didn't get as carried away as Solomon did. Uh, but David had nine, at least nine wives, I think it was. And so his list of children, it's almost one, you know, one per child. He, he did get, um, you know, there was uh, uh, Tamar as, as well as, my, mine just went blank. Starts with an A. Abimelech. No, Absalom. Uh, yeah, Abimelech was the other one that died. Uh, but Absalom and Tamar were from the same mother. But almost every, you know, almost all of his children were half siblings. David is their father, and then different mothers. Um, so, and obviously his his infatuation with Bathsheba, the affair that they had. She gets pregnant. He ends up after trying to get Uriah drunk and make him go home so the people would think the baby is his. David ends up having Uriah killed at the front, ordering Joab, his, his commander, to attack the walls you know, of the city that they're besieging and then draw back so that Uriah is left by himself so he'll be killed. And then he did. So it was not only adultery, but it was murder. But it was all because David had a wandering eye. And you know, when Nathan the prophet confronted him and speaking for God, he said, you could have any wife you wanted. You could have anything you wanted, and you choose to steal somebody else's and then commit murder to cover it up. <clears throat> well, that led to so many of David's problems. That she was baby by David died. You know, Absalom is killed after after a rebellion that tears the kingdom apart, and on and on. <clears throat> Solomon comes along. He looks really good at the start, but he gets so infatuated with women, does what they're not supposed to do. He marries foreign women allows them to worship their gods and even encourages it, and all of the history of Israel gets torn apart after that. So, women are the problem for you know, some of the kings. Um, <clears throat> but this is one in which you know, there really is a sense. Um, it, it's almost as though the, the non-royals needed to teach the royals a lesson about <laughs> fidelity and about commitment and all that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, it does, it does elevate the sense of importance Okay, that's all I have on Song of Songs, um, and it's time to take the test.